Well, thank you everybody for joining. Um, today is an exciting webinar we have planned ahead and I would like to share my screen so we can get started. Uh, first, I would like to welcome our guest speakers and say a, a good morning to all of them. Today joining us uh, will be Dr. David Kathan from Kathan Energy Consulting, as well as Omar Jose Guerra Fernandez from Enrel and Jaime Alonso Castillo Marin from Exxon. First of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Peter Lorenz. I'm a program coordinator with the US Energy Association. Um, and this is a webinar that will be recorded. All the participants are muted and their video is off. You are more than welcome and encouraged to use the uh, question and answer function at the bottom, as well as my colleague, Elise Voorhees, will be monitoring the questions. And if you have any problems or uh, anything, please put in the chat and we'll be happy to help them. This is the fifth in a series of energy management webinars hosted by USCA under its EUPP cooperative agreement with USAID's Bureau for Development, Democracy, and Innovation, and is co-sponsored by XM and the Peak Load Management Alliance. Uh, the next one is tentatively scheduled for early April, and um, we'll make an announcement shortly with the confirmed speakers. That's gonna be another great webinar on this topic. And in this webinar, we've got uh, XM to kick it off with the discussion uh, on the Colombian context, as well as uh, Dr. David Kathan, who has many, many years of experience at the FERC. And so we're really excited to hear from both of them, as well as Omar, to provide greater context on DER. A little bit of back, uh, background about us. USEA is the US Energy Association. We're an association of public and private energy related organizations, corporations, and government agencies. And we represent a broad interest of the energy sector by increasing an understanding of energy issues, both domestically and internationally. Internationally, we have two cooperative agreements with USAID, the Energy Utility Partnership Program, um, as well as an up and coming one, which is called the Advancing Modern Power Through Utility Partnership or AMP UP, which is just getting started. If you have any questions about either of those programs, feel free to reach out to me um, and we'd be happy to um, explain any uh, programs that we may be able to get involved with. Um, this webinar is gonna be found on our uh, website as well as our YouTube. And if you have any questions um, uh, regarding the webinar series, we'd be happy to reach out to me or Johanna klumans Bainen, the program manager uh, of this webinar series. Like I mentioned earlier, this is gonna be recorded. Uh, later this week, we'll be sending out the recordings as well as the presentations from, um, from our presenters here. With that, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. It's going to be Jaime Alonso castillo Manin. He's been at XM for over 15 years, uh, which is the system operator and administrator of the Colombian electricity market, where he's had positions such as operation programming specialist and operations planning director. He's the electrical, he is an electrical engineer from the uh, Colombian School of Engineering and has a degree from the University of Rio de Janeiro. Uh, following Jaime, we will have Dr. David Kathan. He formerly worked at FERC's Office of Energy Policy and Innovation and currently serves as the president of Kathan Energy Consulting, a boutique consulting firm focused on electric power issues, demand response, and DER. Dr. Kathan retired from the commission at the end of 2022 after nearly 20 years of work with the commission where he led numerous projects, including the incorporation of DER aggregation of the wholesale market, um, which is also known as order number 2222, as well as the commission's response, um, demand response report, which were, was required by the Energy Policy Act of 2005. Following both of them, we'll have Omar um, joining us from NREL. He's a research engineer at NREL in Golden, Colorado, and works within their power systems design and planning group. One last housekeeping issue is at the bottom of your screen, you will find a, a little globe that says interpretation. Our first presenter will be in Spanish. So if you would like to hear it in English, you can just click on that globe and select the audio stream that is best for your language. Um, and with that, I would like to hand it over to um, Jaime. Please get started when you're ready. Hi everyone. Uh, I don't know, Peter. I can see the the, the way this. Okay. Okay. No. Okay. Sorry. 
Sí, podemos ver tu pantalla. Ok, great. Uh, hi, everyone. It's a pleasure to be, to be here uh, to, uh, I don't know, to share the experience uh, and the context of Colombia in DERS. And we have the opportunity to share this webinar with David and, and Omar. Uh, I want to start speaking Spanish to be more clear in this context. And thank you so much. Very well. So briefly, I will present uh, the, con the Colombian context with some figures that we have in the National Interconnected System, together with the mission to transform energy, then policy, specifically around documents uh, from the Craig 2223 and then other matters. This presentation has been provided uh, showing uh, the Colombian context and also drawing from previous presentations. So I will emphasize this initial slide, which is new uh, when compared to the previous seminars, where we can see that the Colombian uh, system has 18.8 .8 megawatts, mostly hydro. And of those, 969 megawatts are located in the distribution networks or grids in 155 plants. These are mostly hydro plants found in these grids, but we have also had significant growth in solar, which is also found in the distribution grids. The growth expectation for these systems is quite large for 20, by 2028. And these figures are without considering information from the latest, uh, from the latest report on energy in the country. And by 2028, we will have a total of 143 projects and 1,623 new megawatts to be connected in this distribution grid in our country. The mission to transform energy, that is work being done by experts. And one of the focus points on this mission is to look at modernizing the grid. And here specifically, to work on everything having to do with Again, modernizing and digitizing the grid by using DERs. We also spoke of the need to add DER to have decentralized controls for these DERs and to also consider the criteria for explaining, uh, expanding and planning the operation uh, for DERs specifically. This was all materialized in a policy and in a resolution, uh, resolution 4283 that defines DERs for Colombia and tasks the CRAG with establishing detailed guidelines as provided by the ministry. So they will, it will create uh, demand response mechanisms, storage, aggregation activity that the, it also establishes that the DER must engage in the wholesale market. And this will also be covered by David's presentation, uh, showing uh, everything around order 2222. And it also states that the DER must be able to provide services in SDL and well, other matters. Here, I would highlight that the policy does recognize that there may be conflicts of interest between grid operators, DER owners, and the aggregators as far as assigning connection points, operations, and market share. The Craig documents, well, as of last year, we have been developing uh, these initiatives uh, around mobile, mobile uh, ele electric mobility, through circular letter number one, the demand response for the internet, for the national system, that how to engage in storage in a market in Colombia and others. And it clearly establishes that the 2023 agenda will continue to develop these matters further. Where in the first quarter, the document analysis will be done for aggregators and then the definitive res resolution will be issued uh, somewhat later. This will be done via studies and other retail uh, and, and looking at retail models all around DERs. 
So to give you a new slide for this seminar, uh, a new slide in this presentation is that we now through circular letter number 10, the regular now has submitted how aggregation would take place and the requirements and characteristics that must be in place to enter the market. So it first defines what the aggregation activity means. And it's defined as uh, adding DERs to the portfolio that may render services to the wholesale markets and to the distribution grades as well. So by defining it as such, the policy issued by the ministry enters into effect to incorporate DERs into the wholesale, wholesale markets and distribution markets. It also establishes three types of DER units. One is demand response DERs, uh, the generator DER and a hybrid DER, and shows how they all interact with the grid. And, and it basically establishes the consumption pattern and, and how each of these three must behave. It also establishes a minimum aggregation of 0.5 megawatts modeled in every transmission node. So it, it, it establishes how DERs must engage in a wholesale market. It also, in addition to determining the DER units, it also establishes the same breakdown for aggregation, for generation and hybrid and demand response. And then it also establishes what an aggregator is. An aggregator would carry out any of these activities individually, or there might be an aggregator that covers all three activities in a single unit. That would be a comprehensive aggregator, or there's the mixed modality for aggregators, which, which might do two uh, or three of these activities. That's what the document uh, establishes. And it, and it also establishes other market measures. And the aggregation market is thus opened up to these uh, central agents and others to intervene and to follow a certain uh, competition criteria. So the current agents can participate as well as new agents. The possible or the, the potential conflicts of interest have been determined and they would be managed by a regulation uh, between the aggregator and the retailers and the aggregators and the managers. Lastly, It also establishes the different uh, business models that might be in place for the aggregators, mainly initially focusing on demand aggregation, but subsequently it would also consider the other aggregators and establishes a roadmap for each. XM for many years now has been studying, well, we as operators of the national system and the wholesale market administrators also, we are highly interested in these technologies and how they might engage in a market and how they would operate in the system. So to that end, we have been reviewing the system and we have proposed to the Craig that uh, the markets be opened to DERs as per the policy that's been issued. So we've we've recommended that a hybrid modality be used for DERs in wholesale markets so that they can engage also in the distribution market and so that there's a hierarchy to operations as a whole. So in that sense, as far as the hybrid architecture, there are several stages, so to speak, that we could engage in. And for that, three were submitted to the Craig. One being where aggregators would initially report to the market, uh, to the wholesale market exclusively, 
and operationally, they would have uh, great control uh, for DERs, and then they would eventually change over into the DSO model where they can engage in the distribution markets and that would be done or rather the oversight would be uh, under the DSO modality. And then there would be a final stage where the DSO would centralize the various aggregators to scale the services that DSOs provide into the wholesale market. XM proposed a roadmap to the CREG, establishing the first stage would be the, which would be to establish the, the hybrid architecture. And then we could then go into what we've called hybrid architectures two and three. So again, it's a pleasure to join you all here today to share with you what this uh, order 2222 uh, entails, what who the various stakeholders are, and what impact there might be to the grids from there on. So for time reasons, I will just go ahead and hand it back to all of you, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Jaime. It was an excellent presentation. I don't think we have any questions right now. There was one question just regarding uh, distributed energy resources. When we're talking about DER, we're referring to um, kind of small scale energy resources that are primarily situated on um, solar panels, situated based on the solar panels or the needs of the community and battery storage. Um, it's quite a transformative uh, market. So I think it's uh, one of the more emerging areas in energy management issues that we're seeing. With that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Kathan. Um, like I said earlier, he recently left the FERC uh, here in the United States and has an excellent history regarding DER and has a really uh, excellent presentation queued up for us. So with that, I'd like to pass it over to, to you, David. Thank you. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, so uh, before I start, I just wanna mention that uh, I actually have you know, uh, come down to Columbia a couple of times uh, to present on demand response issues uh, to ASA CODIS and to a, a, a smart grid conference in the past years. Uh, in addition, I have another connection that uh, my daughter did spend a year studying at the Universidad de Colombia in Bogota. Uh, so I'm a, a lot of connections and, and love the country. So uh, let me start on the presentation. Uh, what I'm gonna review is uh, DERs in general, but really more of a focus on uh, how the uh, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, developed the capability for demand response aggregate, I mean, DER aggregations to participate in wholesale markets. Uh, the, uh, the outline of my talk is, I'm going to talk in general about the level of DER deployment, uh, some definitions of DER, then we'll go at a higher level on what's inside of 22, 22, and then I'll drill a little bit deeper into uh, the implications of order number 22 for wholesale operations uh, and planning and markets. So what is a distributed energy resource? I think uh, Peter was just uh, mentioning what they might be, and they can include the rooftop solar, uh, distributed storage, like a, a Tesla Powerwall, it could include um, emergency generators or fossil fuel uh, type of gen sets like uh, this Generac set, or it could include electric vehicles and, that, and their, uh, their charging systems. It could also include demand response. Uh, this is you know, it's a smart thermostat, uh, the Nest thermostat uh, made by Google. But in addition, there's also other uh, definitions that include uh, you know, a, a larger resources like uh, cogeneration. Cogeneration co -generation system here was uh, in place at the University of Wisconsin in Madison, Wisconsin. Or it could also potentially include community solar, which are smaller uh, uh, groups of, of solar providing uh, resources for individual customers that can't individually have their own rooftop solar. Or it could be include uh, in battery energy systems that uh, are not connected at distribution systems. 
So there's a variety of different types of uh, DERs that can exist. So that led to you know, a, a key question, what is the definition then? Uh, and there are many definitions. Uh, two key ones is uh, ones uh, that are put out by FERC and, uh, and by uh, North American Energy Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC. Uh, they include for NERC, any resource on the distribution system that produces electricity is not otherwise included in the uh, NERC definition of bulk electric system. And look at this definition. The key issue is that it produces electricity versus uh, FERC's uh, definition is a little broader. And it says any resource located on the distribution system, any subsystem thereof or behind a customer meter. So there are two parts of that, which are one, that it is any resource. It's not specifying and has to produce electricity. And also it can be front or uh, behind the meter. Uh, and along with that definition, FERC uh, stated that uh, DERs may include, but are not limited to resources, as I said, in front of the meter or behind the meter, but also electric storage resources, intermittent generation, distributed generation, demand response, energy efficiency, thermal storage, and electric vehicles and their supply equipment. A couple of slides on uh, status and where uh, the, the trends are in distributed energy resources in the United States. This is a slide that was generated by Wood McKenzie, a uh, market research company, and looking from 2015 up projected to 2025, and you know, indicating you know, what's been growing the most. And as can be seen, the two areas between 2015 and 2020 was growth in uh, load management, i.e. demand response, but also a a solar. Uh, between 2020 and 2025, uh, similar growth is expected in solar and uh, demand response. But in addition, uh, there is a uh, EVs and a battery storage are projected to be uh, part of the distributed energy resources on uh, the grid. A, a, now drilling down at least one state, and I know uh, Hawaii is not exactly you know a, the a normal state in the United States. It's, it is it's an island. It has a uh, a different set of resources and, and challenges, uh, and they like to call themselves the Post Guard from the future. Um, and they have a requirement to to go 100% renewables by 2045. And these are the projections that Hawaiian Electric Company uh, pro has provided on what it will uh, look like in 2020, 2045. And you can see uh, customer DERs make up a large portion of that portion. And it depends on what island they are in, in, in total across the whole state. Uh, the, the customer DERs are going to be north of 15% and can be as large as almost 23% on the island of Maui. So these are significant numbers and we'll need, the state and the utility needs to start accommodating and be able to uh, be able to uh, process and plan and forecast for the operation of the DERs. And so that's one of the reasons that uh, DER aggregation uh, was created. Um, and some of the reasons that DER aggregation has been put forth and was developed uh, is because in FERC in order 2220 uh, to uh, put it in place was that uh, many DERs, especially behind the meter resources, are too small to participate in wholesale markets. Most uh, RTOs and ISOs uh, set a minimum offer size requirement of at least 100 kilowatts. I saw that uh, from Jaime's presentation, there's a 500 kilowatt uh, minimum in, in Colombia. Uh, furthermore, many of the resources that are greater than 100 kilowatts and located on the distribution grid uh, do not have the capability or the interest uh, to spend, uh, become a direct market participant. So they would be interested in working with an aggregator to be able to reach that market, but not have to be do all the extra legal and uh, coordination work in order to do that. Um, and similar to demand response aggregations, uh, DER aggregation. Uh, combine smaller DERs to create resources to serve retail or wholesale needs. Um, I thought that was interesting seeing that the uh, what is moving towards both of the wholesale and retail needs in Colombia. FERC defines a DER aggregation as an entity that aggregates uh, one or more DERs for the purposes of participation in the capacity, energy, and ancillary services markets of the RTOs and ISOs. 
Note that at present, no DER aggregations participate in wholesale markets at the point. Um, and we'll mostly have to wait until implementation uh, of 2222 by the RTOs and ISOs. Uh, most plan for effective dates for their uh, participation between uh, 2024 and 2026. Um, the mid-continent ISO, MISO, uh, is, project, is proposing it a implementation date of 2030. Um, the FERC did approve uh, DER aggregation proposals by California ISO in, uh, in 2016 and New York ISO in 2020, but neither of them have seen any actual uh, aggregations as of yet. So uh, to provide a little bit of a, a summary of why uh, FERC uh, did 22-22 is that uh, FERC found that the existing market rules are unjust and unreasonable in light of barriers that they present to the participation of DER aggregations uh, in RTO ISO markets. Uh, such barriers emerge uh, when the rules are governing uh, participation. These markets are, are focused on traditional uh, resources and effect limit the capability of emerging technologies, uh, or they are uh, the minimum size is too, uh, too large to allow for smaller uh, DER to participate. In addition, existing participation models uh, for aggregated resources, including DERs, often uh, require these resources to participate in RTO mar ISO markets as demand response, uh, which limits the operations and services they are able to provide. A good example is uh, distributed storage. Uh, there is distributed storage who are participating in demand response programs, but that limits, you know, they're uh, providing resources and capabilities to reduce consumption at the, at the site or on the grid, as opposed to uh, doing any of the injection that a, a battery system is able to do. Um, so by removing these barriers, uh, to participation, uh, FERC found that 2222, will enhance competition and will help ensure that RTO and ISO markets are just and reasonable. And then directed the RTO and ISO markets to, uh, are, to, to amend their tariffs to allow DER aggregation to participate. Uh, this is, the next two slides are at a high level, uh, you know, on what are the specific requirements. Uh, I will touch on several of these in more detail. First, as I indicated before, uh, 2222 requires that DER gators must participate directly in RTO ISO markets and establish uh, DER uh, aggregators as a type of market participant. Second, uh, allow DER aggregators to register under one or more participation models that accommodate the physical and operational characteristics of DER uh, character aggregations. I, a key point on that is that uh, FERC uh, chose to not require a new participation model that they like they did for storage in order number 841, but allowed the, R, the RTOs and ISOs to develop uh, their own uh, or use existing uh, participation models. Established a minimum size, as I noted, uh, of at least 100 kilowatts, and then it addressed locational requirements. And what locational requirements mean is that uh, whether a aggregation can span multiple pricing nodes. Uh, and you know that is was a major issue in the order. Uh, and what FERC decided was that to allow the RTOs to propose a uh, a locational requirements that are as geographically you know a large as technically feasible. Distribution factors and bidding parameters need to be specified, as are information and, and data requirements. Uh, there are metering and telemetry requirements that will need to be specified for DER aggregations. And one point on that is that uh, the DER aggregation uh, will be the market participant. The individual DERs as part of the aggregation will not be directly interacting with the RTO. So in a sense, the DER aggregation will be just like any other market participant and therefore be subject to um, uh, their same qualifications, including telemetry and metering as any other DER aggregation, I mean, as any other resource. Coordination was a big issue, and I'll get to that in, in the next couple of slides uh, and how that will need to be set up. Uh, then modifications to the list of resources in a DER aggregation. 
And then uh, market participation agreements uh, for DER aggregators will also be need to be specified. So what is the status of order number 2222? Uh, at this point, four out of the six RTOs, uh, their compliance uh, filings have been uh, they have been approved by FERC and uh, just as recently as last week, uh, orders on the filings from PJM and IELTS of New England were issued on March 1st. Uh, so there are two now still outstanding from uh, MISO and from the Southwest Power Pool, uh, which are still being considered at FERC and may be coming out in some time in the next several months. I, I have no clue on what time they'll be coming out, but. That's the ones that are outstanding. So now drilling into some of the key requirements and in particular how they are you know, will impact uh, the RTOs and ISOs is that as indicated, the DER aggregator is a single point of RTO uh, ISO contact. So in a sense, they're acting like any other resource. Uh, so there may need to be some new specifications in terms of what kind of qualifications and what uh, types of market participant agreements that need to be specified directly for DE irrigation. But in general, they you know, essentially need to act like any other resource and bidding and participating and scheduling and operating uh, as a resource. They are the market participant. Heterogeneous aggregations, uh, and I think Jaime mentioned that that seemed to be one of the things that we've done in, in Colombia, is must be allowed. And that means in multiple different types of resource types, uh, storage, demand response, uh, rooftop solar, uh, community solar can all be combined together to make a, a firm resource. Uh, and that needs to be allowed. Uh, doesn't mean that uh, a, a, an aggregation can't be participate under only just one type, but there needs to be the capability to uh, have a multiple resource types within one aggregation be allowed. Uh, minimum size requirements already noted that um, multiple multi-node aggregations must be considered, uh, and this is, uh, as I noted, is going to was a major issue. And three out of the six uh, have proposed uh, multi-node aggregations, uh, and three have chosen to propose a single-node uh, aggregations. And then the RTOs and ISOs must allow dual participation in retail programs and allow DER to provide multiple wholesale services. That you know, is, is proven to be a little bit challenging uh, for some of the RTOs and ISOs because they do not have any uh, insight into the retail markets and being able to determine whether a DER is already inside of another program, there needs to be a whole set of rules and procedures to be able to determine that uh, during the determining whether a DER is eligible to, uh, to participate. As I noted, coordination is a key part of uh, order number 2222. 60 paragraphs of the order were focused just on coordination. And in particular, the, uh, the order specifies that uh, RTOs and ISOs must revise their tariffs to establish market rules that address coordination between the ISO uh, and RTO, the DER aggregator, the distribution utility, and the RERO or the state or local regulator. All those need to be have coordination capabilities between them. Uh, it also must incorporate a comprehensive and non-discriminatory process for timely review of a distribution utility of the individual DERs to comprise a DER aggregation. Uh, so uh, in, in a later order uh, on order 2222, uh, FERC specified that that can be no longer than 60 days for that distribution utility review. Uh, this is to determine whether a, a, D, a individual DER inside of an aggregation is both either eligible uh, to participate and whether the participation could uh, potentially create safety or reliability issues on the distribution grid and therefore should not be able to participate. And then must also uh, set up a process for ongoing uh, coordination, including operational coordination that addresses data flows and communication among itself the DER aggregator and the distribution utility. So uh, coordination uh, is a, gonna be a key issue in how does a, a, a DER aggregation be able to, who pulls most of its resources from the assets on the distribution grid, 
uh, be able to then to participate in the wholesale markets and wholesale operations. It, it will have to interact with distribution utilities, the DSOs, uh, and also the uh, the TSOs, along with you know even the retail energy providers, in order to make sure that they are capable and are you know their participation and they're settled correctly. This slide is from a EPRI report, which I highly recommend. It's a good summary of what is required in 2222, and the solid lines uh, indicate what are the direct actions that a DER irrigation will need to do. It's you know, obviously to work with the uh, DERs on you know, the customer side, uh, then to aggregate them and to participate in the wholesale market, but also be participate and be able to accommodate into the system operations of a TSO and RTO. The dotted lines indicate the additional uh, interactions that will likely have to happen. Uh, a good example is that you know, a DER on the uh, customer side has to be recognized and be able to be understood in its operation on the part of the DSO. So there's a number of different connections and it, these will have to be addressed and a lot of actions taken in order to make sure this coordination works and new processes are, are developed. This slide is uh, focused on you know, uh, the real-time operation. So one thing was, can uh, the uh, DER participate uh, in the uh, markets in general? Uh, and the next question is, what happens? Uh, how does it operate during the operating day? Uh, and in, in a normal day, when everything is fine, you know, the our DER aggregation will you know, submit a, you know, in a, uh, a, a, a day two market, We'll send, submit a day ahead bid, get it cleared in that market, and they'll be scheduled to operate in the operating day. Um, and if that's all fine, that's all you know, it's worked, then you can figure out settlement later. Uh, but in cases of when there's something happens after the close of the day ahead market, for example, a truck running into a pole uh, with a transformer on it, or there's some uh, other problems that are occurring on the distribution grid that limit the capabilities of the DERs to operate fully, that's gonna impact how much uh, generation uh, or how much resources can be participate in the, you know, uh, to meet the scheduled amount uh, that came out of the day, day head market, what is now in the schedule. So the DER will need, aggregator will need to tell the RTO uh, if they can't find other resources to participate in their aggregation that they'll need to adjust their schedule and, and adjust their bid. There are lots of processes that uh, most of the RTOs and ISOs have for uh, resources to be able to uh, uh, adjust their uh, schedule uh, up until near real time. Uh, but what is gonna be needed uh, is the communication and procedures with the distribution utilities in order to, if there is that you know, truck you know, uh, 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 running into a pole, the, uh, the distribution utility will need to alert the uh, DE aggregation uh, that indeed uh, that particular DER will not be able to operate. And so that has to be done in sufficient time to, such that the aggregator will be able then uh, re uh, readjust its bid in, in the markets. So there'll need to be new procedures on this and it will definitely be a, a key issue. Uh, another uh, a good, you know, this particular slide comes from another EPRI report, which I highly recommend, which was went into detail on the information flows and process steps that will be required for uh, coordination for uh, bringing uh, DERs into the RTO ISO markets. So with that, I, I've finished my presentation and I'm available for any questions. Thanks, David. Um... I will give it a minute for questions to come in if there are any. I just did have one question. You mentioned the time horizon of about 2030 for the sort of implementation by the ISOs. Is that um, set in stone or is there some wiggle room if they reach it earlier or later? What's their, what's your general feeling on that? Um, number one, 2030 is only one RTO. Uh, one RTO, okay. That was, and that's also uh, had not been subject to a, a compliance uh, order I, either. So I can't tell you what the, the commission will do with that proposal. I know that there's a lot of controversy within, you know, the stakeholders uh, and uh, parties about that uh, length of time. 
since the rest of the RTOs and ISOs are in more in the 2024, 2026. But I, I, I can't tell you whether they're going to do it faster. I know that uh, at least in the ones that have been already approved, uh, a New York ISO had originally said they'd be able to uh, participate by 2022. And they have now have amended and have said that they will be participating. I think in 26 is when they're going to be fully uh, prepared to have their systems up and running. So I'm, I'm not, there is a lot of work that needs to be done, both on the RTO and ISO side, in order to bring systems up, to change the rules, uh, to change the processes, but also the distribution utilities and the uh, regulators will need to adjust how the DERs will be able to participate. So there is a lot of work to be done before the, these are fully integrated into the market. There was, a, I think, a follow-up question to what I asked, and it was just regarding, you mentioned New York ISO. I'm assuming it's very similar with KISO in that they are kind of solving the issue as they go along regarding the implementation and aggregation. Is that generally um, how you feel? Yes, yes. The, it, it, uh, of those first two, which are KISO and, and New York ISO, uh, they since they've had proposals already in, in a place that have been approved, they didn't require as much change, you know, in their proposals based on, you know, uh, what the commission directed in their orders. Uh, so they have less of a hill to climb than the others, uh, but even they are saying, well, this is, this is harder than we had thought and we need more time. And that was when you know, New York ISO said when they were, uh, came in and asked for more time. And then there's a question, um, this might be a little bit out of your purview, but it's 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 regarding lessons learned um, from KISO um, and NI, uh, New York ISO and how they were incorporated into the final rule of FERC order 2222. Um, was there any influence from those kind of lessons learned in your opinion? I'm not sure about the lessons learned uh, because you know there has been no participation, especially in KISO. Uh, but I will say that uh, the their proposals uh, did influence the design of Order 2222. The, for example, the distribution utility review process, that is what incorporated in both of those. The California produced, uh, proposed that initially, and uh, the what you see in 2222 is a variant or you know a version of that just expanded into be more in detail. So, um, you know, they are, they did influence, um, uh, but I don't know if there's lessons learned that I could say at this point. Um, I will say one of the reasons in uh, California why they have not seen it is not necessarily a problem with the rules and more having to do with issues uh, that are still not resolved at the state level. And in particular, uh, whether uh, various resources uh, like DERs and demand response are able to receive resource adequacy uh, credits and that has been a major issue on why you know, there's not been as much participation. Excellent. Um, let me just check the chat. I, I don't think there's any follow up questions. Um, so with that, I would uh, say thank you for your presentation. And um, if anyone has any outstanding questions that were not answered, you can email me. I'll put my email in the chat and we can pass them on to Dr. Kathan. With that, I would like to pass it over to Omar um, from NREL. He will be joining us uh, as the final kind of presenter here. And um, Omar, it's, it's uh, all yours. Uh, thank you, Peter. Um, I'm going to just provide kind of holistic context of DERs, right? Um, basically, you know, the idea is to, to explain why these type of technologies could be key if we want to move towards net zero energy systems. That is the, the idea. Uh, it's going to be very short, but hopefully very informative. So, um, you know, if we want to avoid uh, climate change consequences, right, we may want to be net zero by 2050. And, you know, there are different ways to do that. But in this diagram, you can see the projections from the International Energy Agency on how to decarbonize different sectors of our um, economy. And this is just, you know, 
just a scenario, right? Like there are a lot of uncertainties regarding which technologies are we going to be using and which uh, sector are easier to decarbonize, et cetera. But just to show an example of what we may need to do in order to move towards a net zero energy system by 2050. So of course we need to decarbonize the power sector and you know that this has been the focus of these uh, webinars. Um, and for the decarbonization of the power sector, we may know that uh, we need, you know, wind, solar PV, basically, you know, renewable energy resources. That includes wind, solar PV, but also geothermal, hydro, biomass, et cetera. Uh, we also may need different um, energy storage technologies to facilitate the integration of wind and solar across different time scales, including, um, for example, lithium ion batteries, hydrogen, et cetera. But then we also need to decarbonize the industrial transportation and building sectors. And in my opinion, this is the place where the place where uh, DER could play a significant role. For example, imagine a, a electric uh, vehicles, right? So what we are doing really is to put renewables or to get renewal from the power grid and put those renewables into the uh, transportation sector. So basically, you know, we are using this DER technology to decarbonize the transportation sector using renewable from the power grid. So DER could play this cross-sectoral integration role that in my opinion could be key to decarbonize those sectors that are harder to decarbonize, right? For example, in the industrial transportation and building sector, we may not be able to integrate wind and solar uh, in, in the way that we are doing in the power system, right? We may need distributed energy resources, for example, a electric vehicles, a heat pump, for example, etc. cetera. So um, the, the, the key takeaway here is that DER could help us to decarbonize the energy system by facilitating this cross-sectoral integration of wind and solar PV or renewable uh, energy resources. Just uh, as an example, in this diagram, you can see a variety of DER technologies in different sectors. For example, we have distributed generation in the residential sector. For example, you put uh, solar PV panels on the top of your house. Um, we can also have behind the meter batteries. For example, if you have the like dynamic uh, tariff in your house, you may want to use that storage device to shift energy across different uh, um, hours to reduce your uh, energy supply cost. Then, as I mentioned before, in the transportation sector, we have, for example, electric vehicles. Of course, we need uh, uh, meters, smart meters, basically, right? Because we want to send signals to the vehicle. Okay, you know, if energy is cheap from the power grid, we want to charge our electric vehicle, for example. Um, in the building and industrial sector, we have technologies, for example, the heat pump, and this technology, in my opinion, is going to be key, for example, in North America, because with this technology, we could decarbonize or, you know, achieve significant carbon reductions uh, in the building sector in a cost-effective way. So uh, heat pumps, you know, I, I think are going to be um, key in that area. We also have demand uh, response, basically, you know, how users may change the shape of energy consumption in view of dynamic electricity uh, prices. So in general, I would say DERs um, are a variety of technologies that will allow us to do this cross-sectoral integration of the energy uh, uh, systems to help to achieve net zero uh, by 2050 or maybe uh, before 2050. And you know these technologies, I think, are going to be key, and they are going to play a big role in this transition towards net zero energy systems. So, with that, I would like to keep room for some uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Let's see if there's any questions. I think it's very interesting to, to see how the variety of, of DER resources created a numerous problems, well, potential problems. Yeah providers and, and all manners across the energy sector. Um, Johanna, you have your hand raised? Yeah, I just wanted to make a comment um, on what uh, Omar was just presenting. Um, and to make the point that these are topics, the, be the building, uh, residential, commercial housing are topics that we want to address further on towards the end of the energy management webinar series. So we've, we're sort of working our way down from the 
energy markets, the wholesale markets to distribution level to commercial and residential building sector as, as we progress. We've been a little bit stuck on the on the ISO level because there's there's so many very basic questions that we need to resolve to integrate these renewable energies. Um, but we we do plan to go further further on in this uh, in this webinar series into into that topic. So thank you for that overview thank introduction, you. and I hope to draw you into that part too. Thanks. Absolutely. Yes, yeah, so it's an excellent uh, kind of segue into our, as we go forward with this webinar series, we've been looking at the very macro level um, kind of issues and, and, and regulations, and we'll be driving smaller and smaller into kind of um, the consumer producer kind of realm of individuals as we go forward. Um, with that, I'll leave some space for some questions if there are any other additional questions for our speakers. And uh, while everyone's thinking of their questions, thank you so much to uh, David and Jaime for their, for their presentations as well. That was super interesting. Thank you so much. Well, I don't see any questions. So with that, um, I think we will uh, wrap up this webinar and I would like everybody to stay on top of their emails. I'll be sending an invitation to the next webinar series in early April. Um, we'll be becoming the next topic on DERs as well. With that, one last thank you to Omar, David and Jaime. Um, many thanks for you joining and um, we look forward to our next conversation on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good one. Bye-bye. Thank you so much.